Right. Uh, welcome once again. Thank you all for joining in. Uh, we are successfully into the second month of our Bible college this semester. Yay to y'all. <laughs> uh, I hope it's been a good experience, a learning experience uh, for each and every one of you, and I hope it's been worth your time. Um, before we get started on today's lecture, can I uh, request uh, Anita, would you mind uh, just leading us in a time of uh, prayer, please? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this amazing day. Thank you for this amazing weekend, Father. Thank you for everything that you do for me all the day. I ask you to, um, as we come before your presence this morning, Father, I ask you to bless each one of us, Father. I would like to give this session into your hand, Father. I would like to give each one of us into your hand, Father. I would like to give Pastor into your mighty hand, Father, as we are talking to him, Father, uh, to him, to us, Father. I would like to bless each one of Father. And uh, Holy Spirit, guide us and give us the wisdom and help us to understand the session, Father. As we are learning, praise and worship, Father. We just praise you, worship you, and glorify your holy name, Father. Yes, Father. Amen. 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 Thank you, Anita. Uh, all right. Okay. All right. Let's get started. Okay. Um, so we've been looking at this uh, on the topic of praise uh, quite uh, deeply. Uh, we've been learning about it, uh, different postures of praise, uh, different expressions. We will learn about different expressions of praise in this uh, section today. Uh, but we've been learning quite a bit about the power of praise, the foundations of praise, and how it's just beautiful, how God is magnified in our praises, right? He is enthroned on our praises. Um, this is something that I learned very recently, as, as recent as the day before, is that to be uh, to dwell or to be enthroned in the Hebrew uh, root word literally means to sit down. Um, and that kind of blew my mind again, you know, it just never ceases to amaze me, the different perspectives of, you know, as we learn on this subject of praises, when we say that uh, God is enthroned on our praises, that means he literally sits down, he dwells, he sits down on our praises, uh, you know, on, on the throne of praise, uh, that image just uh, you know, blew my mind. So we've been learning quite deeply about uh, praise, the uh, the foundations and the power of praise and how closely it's related with warfare, right? And uh, in the last chapter, uh, I mean, in chapter four, right? And if I'm sorry, if I'm not mistaken, not chapter four. Yeah, yeah, chapter four, yeah. Uh, we From Second Chronicles chapter 20, uh, we see the... the that episode of Jehoshaphat and, and Judah as a nation going into warfare and how uh, they fix their eyes on God and how they rely and put their trust and faith in his word. Uh, and uh, even before they go into a battle, they bow down in worship uh, the previous day. And the next day, they send the worshipers uh, ahead of the army and how God gives them the victory. And... Uh, uh, and another story we saw of was of Paul and Silas, the very popular, famous Sunday school story that we always, uh, all of us know about, is uh, how they were beaten, stripped, and embarrassed publicly, uh, and falsely accused. Uh, and through their pain, through their sorrow, and through their shame, uh, you know, they pour forth their praise. And in as a result of their praise. Um, you know, every other prisoner is set free. They don't escape, but they are set free. Jailer and his entire family is saved as a result of their praise, right? Um, and as I was, uh, you know, as I'm sharing this, I was I'm reminded of this one story where uh, a young person goes up to the mountaintop to uh, kill himself, to commit suicide, and there, you know, God. Uh, there's just two young people who are already up there in the mountain. They were praising and worshiping God. And this person who goes up there to uh, throw, him, throw himself off the cliff, hears these two people praising and worshiping, and then he gets saved and he decides not to kill himself. Um, so, uh, you know, it's similarly, I think, up, your worship is so powerful, right? One of the points that we learned from Paul and Silas's uh, worship was that your praise is not necessarily only for your deliverance, 
uh, right? It's it's for the people around you. You just don't know who needs uh, to be set free. And uh, your praise, uh, one of the things that can do is uh, set the prisoners free around you as well. Okay, so we kind of uh, stopped there. We looked into uh, the pr- connection between praise and warfare. I, by the way, I've shared the notes uh, as a PDF in the stream section. I hope you were all able to download it and keep it for your record, right? Um, cool. So uh, today we we'll just uh, look at a couple of examples of, we are in the page uh, 16 uh, in your notes. We look at shouting in praise. Uh, how shout uh, shouting is uh, is related in praise as a powerful expression of praise. Okay, so uh, if you have your Bibles with you, I hope you do. Uh, we go to Joshua chapter six. Okay, Joshua chapter six. Okay, uh, Joshua chapter 6, uh, just to verse 20 in itself, it says, When the trumpets sounded, the people shouted. And at the sound of the trumpet, when the people gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. Okay, that's just a verse, uh, that's just one verse, okay? Uh, but... Uh, what I would like to, us to do is read that entire chapter till that verse. Um, and actually, let's start from chapter 5, verse 13 onwards, because that's where that's really where the this whole section of the fall of Jericho kind of starts, okay? In Joshua chapter 5, verse 13 onwards. Is everybody there? Just give me a quick amen if you're there. Amen. Okay. Amen. All right. Okay. Awesome. Okay, let's go. Um, Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. I'll read it for us. I'm reading from the NIV. Um, now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as a commander of the armies of the Lord, I have now come. Okay, this is incredible right now. So uh, what's happening there is what most scholars will call it as Christophany uh, or or theophany. All right, it's uh, it's uh, what's it's uh, it's pre-incarnate Christ manifesting himself. Okay, so and Joshua doesn't realize that uh, until he says. Uh, neither, he replied, verse 14, but as a commander of the armies of the Lord, that is no one else but Jesus. Uh, then immediately after he says that, check out Joshua's response. Then Joshua fell face down. Okay, he doesn't say Joshua went face down, goes face down. He says Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence. Okay, uh, I want you to remember or underline all these words because it's going to come in connect connection with the next chapter when we learn about worship, okay? Um, And you'll understand why when we get there. So Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now chapter 6 begins. Now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Okay, Talk about borders being closed, quarantining themselves. (laughs) Uh, But in this case, uh, they were in complete shutdown or lockdown because of the Israelites. They had heard what God had done to the armies that went up against this this nation, this great nation. They had heard about how the army of Egypt were drowned uh, in the sea. So because of that, they had completely shut down. Okay, they know that Israel is the 
Israelites are coming for them, they, they won't completely shut down. Then the Lord said to Joshua, verse 2, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram horn, ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trump trumpets. Okay, underline priests. Okay, it's important. With the priests blowing the trumpet. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have all the people give a loud shout. Okay? When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have all the people give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and all the people will go up and every man straight in. Okay, that kind of sets the context, isn't it? Uh, but another important part, uh, which I just want to highlight here, it's not, a, uh, I mean, it is significant in its way, is that Joshua, so if you read the chapters before this, right, it says that the army of Israel had camped or had pitched their tents uh, far away from Jericho. Okay, so, and uh, and when you do a little bit of the study, it says they were, they say the camp of Israel was at least 15 kilometers away from where Jericho is. And um, the, the spy nature of Joshua, remember it's, Joshua had already come into this land as a spy. And at this point, Joshua is by Jericho all by himself. Uh, he's, he's alone, okay, 15 kilometers away from his actual army. Uh, and, you know, and he must be, if I have, if I, were to put myself in the shoes of Joshua, um, he was bold. I mean, he's looking at this immense wall, uh, you know, this that's in, that's a, that's in front of him. Uh, you know, he's I'm sure he's confront, confronted, conflicted. It's like it seems impossible, uh, you know, but but I know God is there for me. I know God is on our side because that's exactly what him and Caleb did, right? When the 10 spies goes, everybody else saw, came back with a kind of a negative report, although they were facts, right? They stated the facts, the eight other spies, but only Joshua and Caleb said, it's like, yeah, yeah, they are, but, you know, our God is bigger, isn't it? Um, so he, I'm sure, you know, standing in front of the Jericho wall, he's just, uh, saying, okay, you know, this looks big, it looks impossible, but Nothing is impossible with God. And then he has this encounter, uh, you know, with the commander of the armies of, uh, of Lord's hosts. Um, and then God, God gives him this promise. The Lord said, you know, in, in chapter 6, verse 2, it says, The Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. Uh, the walls didn't come down uh, yet. Uh, nothing has happened yet, but God has already given the promise. And Joshua just believes it, right? And he goes ahead and, uh, you know, uh, it says everything to the people of Israel, what, what the Lord has told him. Sorry. Okay. And then the, what we see in verse 20 is the result of this encounter. When the trumpets sounded, the people shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the people gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. Okay, so uh, let's look at another passage. Uh, let's keep this in mind. Let's go to Judges chapter 7. Okay, please turn with me to Judges chapter 7. Once again, a, a story of a very famous judge that we all know is Gideon. Okay, I hope you're all there, Judge, uh, Judges chapter 7. Now, a judge in those days uh, really meant a, a deliverer, okay, or a leader. Okay, uh, that's, uh, that's basically what the meaning of the, uh, of the word judge is. So Gideon was one of the judges that, that God raised. And in chapter 7, uh, we see that early in the morning, Jerub Baal, 
that is Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Moreh. The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many men for me to deliver Midian into their hands. In order, in order that Israel may not boast against me that her own strength has saved her, he announced now to the people, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. Okay, I'm, I'm just kind of reading uh, a few scriptures for us to get the context. Verse 3 says, Announce now to the people, uh, verse 3, Anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left, while 10,000 remained. Verse 4, But the Lord said to Gideon, There are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will lift them, and I will swift them for you there. If I say this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. Okay. God's like uh, having like this incredible boss moment, right? It's full boss moves here. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't need so many people to deliver. You know, I, I, I don't want you to boast in your strength. Uh, I want you to know that, uh, you know, I delivered this. Um, Let's, now let's just go down to verse 20, okay? Uh, actually, wait, before we go there, um, let's, uh, let's read from verse um, 12, okay? That, I, hope, I hope that's okay, guys, all right? Uh, Judges chapter 7, verse 12 onwards, all right? The Midianites, the Amalekites, and all the other eastern people had settled in the valley thick as locusts. Their camels could, not, could no more be counted than the sand on the seashore. Can you imagine that sight? Uh, as thick as locusts. Uh, their camels could no more be counted than the sand on the seashore. This is the army that Gideon is going up against. There must be in thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands. Gideon arrived just as a man was telling a friend his dream. I had a dream, he was saying. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. It's interesting a bread can do that. His friend responded, this can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. It's amazing how the enemy can also interpret dreams. <laughs> you know, um, this is the enemy talking to each other. You know, I had this dream, you know, the bread came tumbling down and destroyed all our tents. Uh, verse 15, when Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, check out his response. He worshipped God. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out, get up. The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. Dividing the 300 men into three companies, he placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. Verse 17, watch me, he told them, follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. When I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, then from all around the camp, blow yours and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. Just as they had changed the guard, they blew their trumpets and broke the jars that were in their hands. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars. 
grasping the torches in their left hands and holding in their right hands the trumpets they were to blow. They shouted a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Verse 21, while each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. When, verse 22, when the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. Okay, that's verse 22. When the 300 trumpets sounded, that's incredible. Um, one of the things uh, I wanted to do a study on, which I didn't really uh, find the time to just go deeper, is what's the significance of the jars, just to understand their historical, uh, you know, point. I, I mean, if and when I do, uh, I let you all know the significance of them breaking their jars. I did not, I didn't do that. But uh, if you can, please do it and let me know. I'm more than happy to learn. Um, but just pause there and look at verse 22. When the 300 trumpets sounded, Okay. Now I'm sure we've seen um, a video of an orchestra, right? Where there's a one person, a conductor standing in front, and he's conducting an orchestra. Yeah, you, have you all seen? Uh, speak to me, <laughs> respond to me, just to know that I'm not alone. Yes, master. <laughs> right. Uh, so it, that's. A biggest piece of orchestra is about 120 uh, musicians or 140 piece. That's like you know as big as they can go. Now, in the, in, in that orchestra, you have uh, you you have the strings section, which is one of the biggest sections uh, in the ensemble. You have the violins, the viola, the cellos, the double bass. Uh, you know they all come under the string section. Uh, then you have the percussion section. You have the timpanis and uh, all the drums. Uh, with the symbols and whatnot. Um, then you have the, what are the sections? Percussion, the woodwind sections. You have the flutes, the oboe, clarinet, etc., uh, etc. Et and uh, another section is called the brass section, right? All these brass instruments, like the trumpets and the trombones, the tuba, the big one that comes around where a person goes inside it, uh, blows, uh, and the French horns, right? Uh, now, the brass section are one of the loudest sections in the entire orchestra. Okay, so, and like I said, 120 or 140 piece ensemble orchestra, um, there will be a maximum of four trumpets, just four trumpets. Okay, and those four guys can easily overpower the entire orchestra, very easily, because they are very loud. Okay, so you will always see the conductor, you know, like controlling them, you know, it's like control and play, you know, uh, and whatnot. So, uh, so just to give us a <laughs> perspective, an idea, that's just four trumpets in a 140 piece ensemble. Okay. Verse 22 says here, there were 300 trumpets. Okay. <laughs> uh, I can't imagine, but... It scares me. It really does scare me. I mean, I cannot begin to imagine how loud that must have been. And uh, and it, it's just amazing, guys. And you know, it must have been really, really loud. And then every time you read, uh, you know, the worship that happens in the tabernacle of David and in the temple that Solomon builds later, when you see that how the priests Right, all the priests were in charge of blowing the trumpets. I mean, a bunch of priests, not all the priests. Right, uh, it it must have been a very loud uh, occasion. You know, it must have just been a very loud scene, right? Of of worship, of extravagance. Uh, yeah, I mean, so that's another. This is another example of us, uh, you know, shouting in praise. Um, is there there is a moment there there is a time when God calls us you know as his people okay uh, second Peter and also revelation says by through Jesus we are now not just priesthood we are royal priesthood okay that means you and I like it or not are priests 
okay, we are royal priesthood. And one of the responsibilities of, for us as priests, if we are called to blow this loud trumpets. I mean, not literally, maybe when you can, you can. But we are in charge of lifting up and shouting this loud praise and make his praise known and make his praise glorious, like the psalm says, isn't it? Uh, it's, your, it's your responsibility as a priest, right? And when you read about priests in the Bible, it was their job. It was their responsibility. It was their duty. It was not like they had a choice. It's like, okay, you know, this morning, if you feel like coming and blowing the trumpet, please come. If you don't feel like, please check home, you know, just chill. Uh, you know, no worries. We have you covered. There's another person who will come and fill in for you. It's okay. <laughs> uh, but it doesn't sound like that. It seems like they had no choice. Uh, you know, and similarly, praise is again you know we'll keep repeat you'll keep hearing me say this and i'm sure you've heard this is not really about how you feel i'm going to praise god uh depending on how i feel uh you know etc cetera, etc cetera. no i don't think we have a choice i'm sorry to say that but um and i'm glad we don't have that choice i mean uh when we go to the next section we'll also see it's in a way we still have a choice and that's again a beauty of it, <laughs> uh, right? The Psalms says, the trees of the field, they clap their hands in praise. Uh, the deep sea creatures, uh, you know, worship him. The, in Psalm 19, we see that the star and the heavenly hosts, day and night, they pour forth speech. They don't stop. All of these other creations, they don't have a choice. And Jesus says in Luke 19, if we don't praise, the rocks will cry out. So it seems like every every other creation don't really have a choice, but you and I do. Right? You and I have a choice, an incredible choice. That's what makes your praise and my praise powerful. Because it's birthed out of free will. And I say, I choose to praise you. The cherubims and the seraphim, when you read the book of, uh, you know, in Revelation 4, these mighty angels, and in Ezekiel 1, uh, which we'll read sometime, you read about these cherubims, these super angels, you know, with, with one with the face of a lion and an ox and an eagle and man, you know, surround, surrounding the throne of God. And in Isaiah chapter 6, we read about the seraphim. It simply means the burning ones. That means these creatures are literally on fire before the throne of God, crying out, holy, holy, holy to one another. It's almost like they don't have a choice. But, but the beauty of our worship is that you and I, we have a choice. And I hope and I pray that we will not miss out on this amazing opportunity, uh, you know, just to shout our praise, lift our praises before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and that we will build a throne where he sits down on our praise. He sits on our shouts of praise. He sits on our, on that, on our trumpet sounds. That's just amazing, right? Um, there's a few scriptures that's mentioned for us in the Bible. Uh, um, in your notes is uh, one from Numbers chapter 10, verse 9. Uh, it says, Numbers chapter 10, verse 9, And when you go to war in your land against the adversary who oppresses you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets. You shall sound an alarm. That means, uh, I mean, there's another thing that I think, you know, that uh, the sounding of an alarm does, uh, sounding of the trumpets does is it sends out an alarm to the enemy. As to the moment you go down on your knees, you begin to lift up your hands and you start worship and praising God. It's like sending an alarm to the enemy. It's like, okay, all right, he's going down on his knees. He's going, he's lifting up his hands. Something's about to happen now. You know, it's sending a message. It's sending a signal to the enemy. Okay, Numbers 10, 9 says, When you go to war in your land against the adversary who oppresses you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets that you may be remembered before the Lord your God and you shall be saved from your enemies. Right? Uh, another beautiful reminder, every time the enemy tries to oppress us, uh, come against us, 
uh, you know, raises situations against us, remember to sound an alarm with your praise. Amen. Uh, another scripture is Psalm, eight, Psalm 118. Um, Psalm 118, verse 19 and 20, it says, Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. Okay. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. A gate of thanksgiving. Right? I will enter his gates with thanksgiving. I will enter his courts with praise. Amen. That's Psalm 118, verse 19 and 20. Um, another scripture that's mentioned there is Isaiah chapter 60, verse 18. It says, Violence shall no more be heard in your land, devastation or destruction within your borders. You shall call your walls salvation and your gates, what? Praise. <laughs> Okay, you shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. That's Isaiah chapter 60, verse 18. And uh, let's just read one more scripture from that section. Uh, uh, Judges chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Judges chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. It says, after the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? Okay, they are inquiring of the Lord. Who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to, to fight against them? And check out God's response in verse 2. The Lord said, Judah shall go up. Simply means the praise shall go forth first. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. I've given the land of the enemy to the praisers. Amen. Okay. We have shared uh, the scripture, Isaiah 59, verse 19. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise up, will lift up a standard against him. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes. Okay. So, uh, a couple of notes, uh, just one note there. The key ingredient there in all these scriptures that we saw in, Jer uh, of, in Joshua chapter 6 and Judges chapter 7 was faith. And what increased the faith, uh, the stirred the, the faith of the Israelites was a word from God, like we saw in Second Chronicles chapter 20, right? Right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word, right? So a word from God uh, in their troubled times uh, increased and stirred their faith even before the victory was given uh, you know, to them. Um, so towards the end of this section, I uh, want us to want to once again remind all of us is that you and I have this incredible privilege uh, of being God's priests. You and I have this incredible privilege to make that choice to choose to praise him and praise. Uh, and as a gentle reminder, that your praise is powerful. Okay, don't ever think that your praise does not matter. Okay. All right, guys. Yeah, your praise is powerful. Okay. Um, all right, now let's uh, move on to the next section. Uh, section B in your notes is uh, the expressions of praise. Uh, this, this section is almost uh, like a summary uh, of things that we've learned so far, the different postures of praise. Um, right, we are in page 17 in your notes. Okay, we're in page 17 in your notes. Um, the different expressions mentioned there are... Uh, one of the first one is singing, right? Psalm 47, verse 6, it says, Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. Okay. I, I'll see if I can put that in the chat. Psalm 47, verse 6. It's one verse, and it's, it's, it has sing praises four times. Sing praises to God, sing praises. 
sing praises to our king, sing praises. Just one verse. Uh, I think that should be enough for us to understand that singing means is important, okay? <laughs> uh, right. Another scripture, I mean, which, uh, again, very familiar scriptures, uh, it's not mentioned in the notes, but uh, you can uh, read is Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Once again, paste it for us in the chat section. Okay, Colossians uh, 3, 16, that's from the ESV uh, version. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Okay, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. All right. Um, and uh, another scripture that's mentioned there is Luke chapter 19. Uh, Luke chapter 19, verse 38 to 40. But I'll read for us from... 37 okay if you can turn just quick for a quick glance in luke chapter 19 verse 37 onwards it says as he jesus was drawing near already on the way down the mount of olives the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise god with a loud voice it's again loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen Verse 38 says, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. But verse 39, what happens? And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Right? It's amazing how sometimes it's the Christians who will stop us from praising him. <laughs> I'll just leave that point right there and move on. Okay. Um, this in this passage it was the Pharisees. In another passage we see that the disciples uh, are telling the blind man to be quiet. Right? Uh, you remember that? Right? It's like, hey, be quiet. You know, it was the disciples of Jesus who, who stopped some of the people from coming to Jesus. And it's amazing. Uh, sometimes you don't need the enemy. Uh, <laughs> uh, we Christians are enough for that. But uh, the importance of singing, right? Uh, just beautiful. So the next section, uh, the, the second point is uh, another expression of praise is shouting. Okay, Psalm 47, verse 1. Uh, it says, clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with the loud songs of joy. That's Psalm 47, verse 1. I clap your hands, all peoples, shout to, jo shout, shout to God with loud songs of joy. Okay, um, that's just one verse. Uh, let's, uh, wait, I want to read one more passage. Let's read. Uh, okay, can someone read uh, Psalm 98, verse 4, please? Psalm 98, verse 4. Psalm chapter 98, verse 4. Shout to the Lord, all the earth. Break out in praise and sing for joy. Okay. Shout to the Lord, all the earth. Break out in praise and sing for joy. Okay. Uh, it's very intimidating, isn't it, to do exactly what sometimes what God's word tells us to do. Yes? No? <laughs> it's like... In, uh, yeah, I like to read it, but <laughs> okay. Uh, Jeffina, do you mind reading that verse again for us, please? Yes. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, break out in praise and sing for joy. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the NIV says, "Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth, uh, burst into jubilant song with music." Um, yeah, so that's another reference for shouting uh, as an expression in, in, in praise, okay? The third expression we see is uh, clapping of hands. Uh, Psalm 47, which we just read, clap your hands, all peoples uh, can praise his name. And uh, lifting of, of our hands, um, Psalm, Psalm 134 uh, for us, it says, lift up your hands to the holy places, and bless the Lord. 
Psalm 134 verse 2. It says, Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. Ignore the little R16 and the R17. It's just cross references that I've pasted. Okay, ignore that. Um, in 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 8. Why don't we turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 8. First, first Timothy Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Thanks, John. Okay, so uh, I desire that in every place the men should pray. How? Lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling, without wrath or dissension. Thank you. Um, so, And we've read enough scriptures. If you go back to those two words, yada and toda, as, as, as the two uh, Hebrew words for praise, it's all about lifting up, right, uh, of our hands and praising. And toda, if you remember, is lifting up your hands and giving thanks to the Lord before you've received something from him. Right In expectation, that's the hands of expectation. You praise him with the hands lifted up uh, before God's uh, you know, uh, given you the victory. So uh, lifting up our, of our hands is, is a sign of surrender, reaching out to our Father for help. Um, and um, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, Rosalind. It's, uh, yeah, I think it's in the notes, you know? Uh, yes, yeah, the fourth point there, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. Uh, yeah, shout for joy. ABC music. It's, uh, it's awesome. Thanks, thanks for sharing that, Divya. Uh, the fifth point there is playing of a musical instrument. Um, we all know the significance of it from Second Chronicles. When you read Second Chronicles chapter five uh, and chapter sixteen and chapter twenty-five in Second Chronicles. Um, and you will learn that David actually created a lot of instruments. Uh, we're not going to go deep into that, but uh, and then also, you know, you, we see that when Saul was troubled, uh, he asks uh, for uh, a skilled musician, and David comes, plays the harp, and he's delivered. Right? We all know that uh, David was a skilled musician, and actually, David was skilled in everything he did. Um, you know, as a side note, uh, even as a shepherd, we know the story of David and Goliath. Right? He, uh, you know, he uh, was uh, used his sling to uh, throw a rock. Uh, again, you know, one of, uh, historically speaking, the shepherds would regularly keep throwing stones, not at the sheep, but at the rocks. So every time a stone would hit a rock, you know, it will tell the sheep to go in which direction. If they were, if they were going off stray, they would, you know, uh, fling uh, the stones. So they were very accurate, very skilled shepherds of those days. Um, so David, that way, was skilled in everything he did, be play, you know, being playing an instrument or throwing a stone <laughs> uh, and whatnot. So one a note there is we need to be careful not to become too dependent on those instruments. Uh, for, for us, uh, for those who play an instrument and, uh, you know, you can't say I cannot play, I cannot praise him without an instrument. I need my guitar, I need my, uh, my keyboards or whatever it is. Um, and... Also, as a reminder, your voice is also an instrument, okay? Uh, but instruments are beautiful. Instruments are amazing, but uh, don't just become too dependent on it. Standing uh, is another expression of praise. Uh, it's, it's a sign of respect. You, you, are, uh, you are acknowledging another person's presence, an elderly person. Like, you know, in, our, in, in the Indian culture and whatnot, it, I mean, in every culture, I would assume that, you know, we stand up, uh, you know, when uh, someone superior walks in as a, as a mark of respect, isn't it? Uh, we sometimes stand up for the reading of the word of God. Um, so that's an, uh, the expression. Uh, singing in the spirit, very, very important. Singing in the spirit. Um, John 4, 23, 24 uh, says, For the Father is seeking true worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay, the first thing comes there is in spirit. Okay, uh, he's seeking true worshippers. That means there are false worshippers also. We will look at it at a later point. Okay, uh, but singing in the spirit is very important. Let's uh, quickly go to First Corinthians chapter fourteen and verse fifteen. First Corinthians chapter fourteen, verse fifteen it says, "What am I to do?" Paul is saying, "I will pray with my spirit." 
but I will also I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Okay, so singing in the spirit, singing in tongues, uh, is is another beautiful expression of praise. And the last two points is dancing. Uh, we, let's quickly look at Zephaniah chapter three verse seventeen. Zephaniah chapter three verse seventeen says, "The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save." He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. He will, what? He will exalt over you with loud singing. Now, the, the root word for rejoice, it simply means to, to jump and to spin like a top. Okay? <laughs> the root meaning of rejoice simply means that to jump up and to spin like a top. Uh, <laughs> is this wonderful, right? And and to see that the scripture says that the Lord dances over us, you know, He rejoices over you and me, is beautiful, right? So dancing is another powerful. Uh, is this a beautiful expression of praise? Uh, and one of the points mentioned there is dancing has no inherent value in and of itself. But the spiritual release it can bring is valuable, right? Uh, anything that is used to point towards God, as used in 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 worship towards Him, it's something significant happens. And it's not just for with dancing; it could be playing music, uh, with singing. You know, singing in itself. You know, I, I could teach a parrot to sing, but that doesn't mean parrot is worshiping Him with all spirit and truth. <laughs> You know what I'm saying, right? So singing in itself has no value unless it is used. You know, when you when you connect it with your heart, with your mind and soul, and you worship Him, it suddenly has a different take on it, different perspective on it, right? Um, and final expression has to be one of my favorite uh, is kneeling, bowing, and prostration. This is another posture, another Hebrew word we saw, uh, we read, uh, we studied about is shaha and barak is kneeling before the king of kings in psalm 95 uh, verse 6 it says oh come let us worship and bow down let us kneel before the lord our maker okay there is a recognition of who god is that's happening in that verse oh come let us worship and bow down why let us kneel before the lord our maker you are there is a sense of acknowledgement that is happening that he is a creator we are created right um so those are the nine expressions of praise it's almost like a summary of what we've learned so far um you know singing shouting clapping of our hands lifting of our hands playing musical instruments standing singing in the spirit dancing kneeling and i hope all of this will help you uh you know push you to uh, go to the next level in your journey as a worshiper and and uh, and a person uh, you know as you praise as you praise god amen so that's uh, the end of this session we will pause here uh stop the recording and we'll take a quick break and uh we'll join back in the next session all right I'll see you guys <laughs>